back to the Dallas Starts Organization International podcast. Most of us who spent any length of time studying internal martial arts find that what starts out as an interest quickly becomes an obsession. And that's particularly true in the case of my guest tonight. Alex Cosma began studying martial arts as a child, and in the several decades since then, he's never stopped traveling and learning and sharing what he's learned with others in styles such as Tai Chi, Bagua Zhang, and Xing Yi Chuan, particularly Song style Xing Yi Chuan. You can learn all about uh, Alex's uh, teaching methods and his courses and many books that he's authored at lineofintent.com. But for now, uh, please enjoy this conversation that I had with Alex. He's a great conversationalist and he was very generous with his time and his knowledge. And I hope you enjoy this interview. All right, Alex Cosma, everybody. Alex, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. Thank you. So the, the first question that I ask everybody um, is, how did you inv get involved in the martial arts to begin with? Hmm. Uh, 12 years old. Okay. Um, I just, I'd lived in Africa for many years. And basically where I lived was, was like a paradise when I was a kid. Um, there was a war going on, but it was all in the background. Mm. Dad used to go off for months doing, you know, military stuff. Then he'd come back. Um, so we didn't really see it. We knew it was going on, but the actual lifestyle was very peaceful. I didn't know what fighting was. I didn't know what martial arts were because we didn't have Bruce Lee. There, there was a lot of sanctions on the country. Um, so we had no Bruce Lee. We had no David Carradine. I was in a bubble. And then uh, 12, 12 years old, I moved to England. And because my dad got involved in stuff in uh, Africa, he lost everything. Uh, the pol politics changed. So we come back with uh, basically in poverty. And we mm. lived in a very, very rough place. Uh, and my dad and mum separated. So anyway, I was this um, kid bullied, severely bullied for several years. When I, As soon as I stepped off the plane, I was bullied. You know, I was dark skinned and a uh, different accent. Um, so within a few weeks, my mum put me in a Kyokushinkai Karate class. She knew nothing about martial arts, but some instinct. And the teacher was a chap called Pat Nietzsche. He was a Burmese gentleman, um, ostensibly teaching Kyokushinkai Karate, but he had been a merchant seaman and airman in uh, Asia. So he used to, he became a family friend and he used to come around the house and show me little bits of Kung Fu. Because, oh yeah, at the same time, I was, um, within a few weeks of landing, I saw Monkey, the series of Monkey Magic, the, the old one, where the, the, uh, the guy playing Monkey, he actually knew Japanese martial arts. So he, um, it looked really fantastic. Plus you had all the Buddhist wisdom with him. And then I saw David Carradine every week. And, I, you know, these had a huge effect on my like 12 year old growing uh, brain and especially I was bullied like you know the Kwai Chang Kane character was, was right the, the uh fighting for justice and things like this so, uh yeah so to cut a long story short then I did a year of Kyokushinkai Karate and Pat Meacher he said many many times if you really want to learn this Chinese Kung Fu you have to go to China he said I, I only learned like little bits and pieces but um it's not like karate so uh, 13, I went to London, uh, which was like all my pocket money once a week, I'd go to London. And I met my first uh, Chinese martial arts teacher, who was a Shaolin Lohan expert. Um, yeah, and then it just carried on from there. Then when I was, uh, yeah, then when I was 14, I saw Way of the Warrior, which is... Uh, yeah, the BBC it's documentary. Wonderful. It's yeah. awesome. It's the best ever documentary. Yeah, it was fantastic. And, uh, you know, the Hong Yi Siang episode. Yeah, from yeah absolutely. Yeah. It was the first time I saw Xing Yi. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And Lo De Shu doing the very young Lo De Shu doing the Bagua. And instantly I fell in love with Bagua. I just, um, okay, Bagua is, is what I want to do. So that was 14 years old. Uh, that time there was no, you know, there was no internet. <clears throat> I think there was one Bagua. There was Robert Smith's Bagua book. Yeah. Um, so anyway, my luckily, my Shaolin Lohan teacher was also uh, fascinated with Bagua. So we decided um, to go to China together, to go to Hong Kong. And yeah, I was like 13, 14, and my mum said, no, you're not going. Right. Too young. 
So I, I waited two years, 16, we got on the plane together um, and we went to Hong Kong, tiny, just a very short trip to Taiwan, but mainly Hong Kong. And it was my first taste of uh, Bagua, you know, Bagua, uh, with a Fu style, Fu style people in Hong Kong. Um, again, it was just a short trip, less than a month, but every day we were training in the morning, several hours, and I learned circle walking, single change, uh, Ji Beng Gong. And then I come back to England. I was, of course, I was penniless. I was a young kid. Uh, yeah, that was the beginning. Wow. Now, I saw somewhere where you uh, wrote that at, around that time period, when you were 14 or 15 years old, you were reading about how much time masters put into uh, the internal uh, cultivation, internal martial arts, and that it kind of it blew your mind. <clears throat> when was the first time that you actually experienced something that we would maybe classify as internal power as, a, as opposed to external force? In, in martial arts? Mm -hmm. Yes, in martial arts. Uh, okay, my my Shaolin teachers, so there was uh, my teacher and his older and younger brother. Um, the Shaolin Mohan is the, the traditional system. So they already had shock power. I yeah. mean, they were just, they were the best fighters. They were in the top four fighters I've ever met. Like if there's three of them, the top five fighters. Um, because they were fighting professionally, they were bodyguards, they were teaching the special forces in Britain. Um, they were just fighting all the time, they, they, that was their life. So they had real fighting skill. So that become my basis for or like a reference point for what, what I was looking for. But my teacher always said, oh, this is, um, this is really external. And the Bagua and Xing Yi, he thought was internal. Um, neither of us knew because we didn't have the, the access to it. So what we saw in Hong Kong, we didn't, I didn't feel any special power from the Fu style people. It was just the, the movement was very different. Mm. Um, you know, they were good. They were functional. They could push and things, but I was too young to really know what to ask. Um, and my reference point was my teacher. He was just so brilliant. So when I went back to England, I carried on doing the Shaolin and the um, uh, the little bit of Bagua that I knew. And then the first real something different was my, so that carried on for several years. My Shaolin teacher retired. He, he went off to do business and things. Um, so I had two or three years in the void. Mm. And, um, you know, a youth, uh, I was lost basically. Then, luckily, I found my Sun style teacher, a Sun style Bagua teacher. And he didn't talk about like chi or internal power, but just his movement was like a dragon. It was the real, it was different to the Fu style people. And his teacher was He Shanting in uh, Taiwan, Sun style grand student. And what he was doing, like the, just the quality of the body movement was different. Um, it wasn't even his power because, you know, I was used to power from the Shaolin guys, but uh, he could explain what was the relationship between the mind, the chi, and the physical movements, like the 10 changes of Sun Star Bagua. Um, and then also things like the trigrams, but in the beginning it was more like, wow, the Ji Bengong was really tough. The circle walking was really tough, much harder than the Hong Kong. Um, people uh, and the twist you know it was the first time I'd really seen swimming dragon body explained as three dimensional undulation or you know different body parts um, and really good basics like he could explain the Ji Bengong there's one video of him actually um, the only video of him you can see his form is incredible really really great so that was my first Wow. Okay, this is something different. Yeah. And and was any of that training? Did you do any linear uh, work in that training, or was it all done in circle walking? You mean like sixty-four palm lines? Like it? No, no. No, just there was, or well, there is eight exercises, um, statics. So there's things like turning palms, 
uh, squatting Nagong exercise, the iron bridge, where you go back on a wall, uh, one kicking exercise, coiling dragon, just in space, like a, almost like a sheen, side to side. Um, and then lots of very simple, slow circle walking with mother palms. Uh, so we spent the first year on a uh, single change. Yeah. yeah. What do you think that it was? Detail, about? A lot of detail for what to do, you know, where to, why you should put your hands in a particular, and your eyes, and your, especially the breathing. It's like thing was, it's all in the breath. This was his big thing. It's all in the breath. Not contrived breathing, but you have to be able to sink your up. Oh, that's it. We did a lot of standing with the holding the ball. Yeah. So half an hour standing each side of the posture. Um, that was the basic before we moved. So, yeah, that was a really good training because I, I think before that, my breath was still up, was still middle, midsection. Yeah. And he could see that. So he's he had a very interesting lower dantian. Like you touched it, it would be bubbling. Really? Bubbling. And um, not in a contrived way, it was just he said it. And it wouldn't be all the time. It would be at certain times of the day. It would just happen. And I didn't have that for many, many, many years. That, and finally, one day it happened. And I, uh, <laughs> I remember. Because he said, it's, um, he said, this is very good sign, but the women won't like it. <laughs> because they think it's very weird, right? That you have this bubbling in your, in your lower abdomen. So, yeah. Yeah. With the with the initial circle walking with the Fu people and then later with the circle walking and just doing single palm change for a long time and, and standing meditation, was there something that you think in your personality that was drawn to that sort of, of a repetitive or meditative practice? Because a lot of young people, a lot of people that young come to Bagua and then they just go away very quickly because they find it monotonous until they, you know, they mm. never get to the point where they start learning the more advanced movements. Mm. No, I thought it was awesome. Yeah, you loved it. And, yeah, and I've had so many experiences on the circle. Like the, the very first thing that, like in looking back, I can say it was a distinct experience on the circle. Was a, This doesn't sound very interesting, but I was walking the circle in my backyard. My teacher had gone away for a few days. And I felt so clearly that, oh, the ancestors are watching me. This is very important I do this. Um, and it's so valuable. It's hard to put into words, but it's like this enormous um, understanding that this is not just punch kick. This is something very deep and uh, important for human beings. So, yeah, I can still remember that feeling. And then I asked many teachers over the years, oh, do you ever feel when you're on the circle that there are, you know, like some, you could say shamanic things. I didn't think of it as shamanic, more like an ancestral um, and they all say, yeah, this is very normal. You'll feel there are beings that get attracted to this energy. But the problem is it sounds a little bit, it can sound quite flaky. And, um, you know, I don't emphasize this in, in teaching or practice. It's just something that happens. Um, right. I don't really talk about it, but you are. So, yeah, uh, there's that. And then the, the second thing was um, when it started to blur outside. And then it was very strange because the inside becomes super solid and real. And the, you've done circle walking before. Yeah. So you, you, yeah, I know you what you're talking about. The, the outside blurs, right? Yeah. It, it yeah. becomes almost like the matrix, the energy. And the inside is your domain. That's it. And the first time that happened, because I got over the dizzy stage. Um, so I remember feeling, wow, this is something else. And then, of course, things progressed from there. Yeah. Yeah, it is a completely different mindset. And I I mainly do Shingi, but when I do Bagua, I'll I'll go through cycles where I won't train for a while and then I'll start training again. And it's it's interesting to me how you have certain types of thoughts and experiences when you're doing circle walking that when you move away from that practice for a while, you sort of forget all about them. And then when you go back, they all they all come back to you. It's like slipping yeah, yeah. into a different frame of mind, I guess. It's different, right? It's different to straight line practice. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, some people say it, it's like a shamanic, comes from shamanic Taoist practice. Um, <clears throat> because I'm not really interested in shamanism per se, so I don't think of it like that. It's just, for the energetic, it's, it's distinct. If you practice, you'll understand what I'm talking about. If not, it just sounds a little bit 
out there. Yeah, it definitely has its own flavor. It's kind of hard to hard to put into words if you've never experienced it. Mm -hmm. So how long did you train with that teacher? Five years. Five years. And the, the training. So uh, in the beginning, he I met him in a, a monastery in London. Um, he had just come back from Taiwan, had been there many, many years with his teacher. And then uh, I, <laughs> I invited him to live with my mom and I, my family. Uh, so, you know, she had to come down six in the morning and see us doing this very strange stuff with, uh, for example, be doing uh, teacup practice. Yeah. Uh, with with her teacups. Which, oh, okay. Yeah. You lose teacups on the way, right? So yeah. uh, he stayed with us for a year. Then we all moved in together. There Slowly people came. There was about three or four students, other students. Um, and we had a house in London and we just trained three hours morning, three hours evening. And just all day was was talking about practice or, you know, meditation. Uh, he was deeply into, he was like a member of a, da a Buddhist, esoteric Buddhist order. So he taught me uh, like Zen Chan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, esoteric Buddhism. So that was all part of the, the practice. What did your mom think about all that stuff? Oh, the first Obviously. day, the first day she came down, she cried. She came out, you know, she used to get up early. We was up five. She used to get up six. She came out. She saw that me with the teacups spinning around. She cried. And then, you know, over the next decade, she grew to love the practice, love my teachers, love the students, love the, the whole concept of it. And um, that was really interesting watching a, a, you know, completely uninterested person. She came out, she practiced. Uh, 15 years came out to Taiwan to train with my teacher as well. Wow. So, yeah, people change, right? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So after the five years, what, what happened then next in your training progression? Then um, my teacher vanished suddenly one day. He just wasn't there. Uh, and I met, uh, I went to see Paul Whitworld, see through Paul Whitworld, uh, who I'd met when I was a small child in London. He, he's famous for Chao Ga praying mantles, but he had learned from Ji Jian Cheng in China, uh, Bagua and Xingyi. So I, I did the Xingyi train with him for two years. Um, and again, he's, he's a fighter, tough guy. We used to fight a lot, um, which was really good because I was still, I still had a lot of trauma from uh, being bullied. Um, yeah. And the, the, the Bagua had helped because we fought one of my Bagua Brothers was a very tough guy that we did a lot of stuff, but it was still, you know, it's deep. It goes deep. So that was really good. Then um, trained two years with him, met Serge, you know, French Serge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, trained with him for several years, which was another another tough, very tough fighter. Um, mainly, he had done lots of different Bagua, Xingyi, been in California doing JKD things yeah. with Dr. Yang, all kinds of different things. So we just had a, again, we were living together a lot, fighting a lot, training, all kinds of different things. Um, but at some point, I just felt I really want to go, well, I felt I want to go back to Asia ever since I left, but then it became very strong. I want to go back and I want to find one system and understand the basics from the very simple basics upwards. Um, Sun style, yeah, I had the, basically the system. But I didn't feel confident. I felt many, many bits of the puzzle were missing. Uh, both fighting, meditation, you know, internal work. So I think it was 95, 1995 or 6. I went back to uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, China. That was a whole nother <clears throat> period. Yeah. And, and so what was your main focus of study while you were there? Were you still just trying to train in Bagua mainly? Yeah, I, I wanted to study Bagua, if not Xing Yi Chuan, um, because I didn't know what I would find, you know. So the first week I was there, I met Marco Chen. Um, I'm not sure you're familiar with uh, Tai Chi teacher, yeah. Tai Chi master, who had done a lot of Bagua and Xing Yi with uh, Wang Shu Jin and Chen Pan Ling. Yeah. So the first, the first day we met, he said, okay, you long story, but you can join the class. I said, well, I really want to do Bagua or Xingyi. Um, I'm not interested in Tai Chi Chuan. I put it very nicely, but he said, okay, then you train the Tai Chi with the group 
and then I'll teach you Bagua Shini separately. Um, and he was, I could see already, he was just so good. Uh, okay, I trusted him. Uh, ended up staying with him for quite a few years, lived with him for three years in his family house. Um, did the Tai Chi under duress in the morning and the Qigong. Uh, and, and then we did Shini Bagua throughout like daytime, evening time. Yeah. And he knew a lot about medicine, right? Were you also studying some of that with him at the same time? Yeah, but not uh, not like formal, you know, start from the basics. It was in the clinic. He yeah. was treating people uh, after class. Then we'd go to the hospital for a few hours. So I'd just be with him, asking questions afterwards. Made a lot of notes, asked more questions. And uh, yeah, it was like that. And he also kind of had a reputation for being um, a little bit uh, athletic with his students in his training, I guess, to put it nicely. Um, did you ever have to use any of that medicine on yourself, like from the bumps and bruises and things that you got during training? Yeah, but yeah, I mean, he's very violent because of his background. He was a bodyguard for the president's family. And then he taught the uh, president's guard. So... You know, in Taiwan, these these guys are like the cream of the uh, government forces. They, uh, yeah. I don't know if you've been to Taipei before, but you see them in the presidential palace on the corners of the thing, and they they just look different to normal Taiwanese people. Um, I didn't know he was the teacher until I guess a few months. We were in the park one morning, and this huge, much bigger than me guy, big moustache, was just standing there like this in the corner watching me. And I thought, here we go again, another challenge, and you know. Because I was used to it, I didn't. and um, and then he come up to my teacher and was like, you know, oh, okay, and he he was the present head of the guards, uh -huh. um, so his he was now teaching them, but my teacher had taught the previous generation, um, and Marpa Chen is is a, he's a small, you know, you look at him, he's just kind of unassuming, he walks a bit different to normal people, very something very centered, but. Uh, he doesn't look like a killer, but until he turns it on and then you feel, you know, you're like with a tiger. It's, it's quite scary. So, uh, but he, yeah, he injures people, um, not his patients. He's like, he's got two sides, super compassionate, healer, doctor, Buddhist kind of uh, esoteric Buddhist master. And then this side, if you want to do martial arts with me, this is, as he said, this is how it is. It's not yeah. a dancing. Right. Remember, <laughs> Like one of his uh, classic sayings, I was complaining about being, you know, injured. And he said, if you want sweet words, get a Tom Jones record. <laughs> you know? And if you want fighting, you know. This that's is very it. nice. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was amazing living with him. Uh, just like really old school. Uh, you know, Yo Pei Chong was his first teacher. So he lived with Yo Pei Chong this Taoist uh, wizard in Taiwan, who's apparently from all sources I met in Taiwan, his Tai Chi Chuan was brutal. Uh, the, the only uh, video we have is where he was at his, I think, 85th birthday, where he's a bit tipsy and he's kind of just playing around like this. But his, his um, the application was all for battle, you know. So that obviously left an imprint in all the, the government work that Marpa Chen did. Um, so he said that the, the bad things he had to do, the reason he started deep Buddhist practice was to atone for that, those mm -hmm. things. Um, but he it left an imprint. He just he couldn't he couldn't turn it off. He just when you fought, you just you, yeah you better move quick, protect yourself, and even then you was probably going to get hurt. So there were two times that he injured me severely, like that I thought I was going to die. And um, I didn't use the medicine. He got the medicine and gave it to me. So yeah. luckily, I survived. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a fine line, I think, and, and a lot of people misunderstand because um, that's the way that a lot of this training used to be. And now so many people come to these particular martial arts for health and healing and things of that nature that when they see something like that, they can term it abusive. And in a lot of cases, it is, uh, you know, uh, both in the East and in the West. But you made an interesting point in uh, your uh, Tai Chi book about Marpa Chen's method that um, these types of injuries we get, we see them all the time in MMA and kickboxing gyms, and no one really thinks twice about it because it's just part of learning to fight. 
But when you see that in something like in a Tai Chi class setting, you know, it, it, it people are taken aback by it. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it depends on what you're trying to learn, right? Uh, you know, I don't know how many, you'd probably know more than me, but in the Tai Chi training community, uh, how many people have that kind of approach? Because also, I'm not very interested in Tai Chi Chen. I'm so focused on the other things that um, yeah. I didn't really look around afterwards. So I don't know. I mean, there's some famous schools like the Wudang school, the uh, Wustar. One branch of it, they're famous for fighting. But I don't think many people, it's mostly a health system. So it's not probably the best example of Chinese martial art, um, how it was for fighting. What was the potential of it? Because if we look at the stories of the old teachers, they were awesome, right? That's one of the things that draws us to this piece. Right. The possible potential. How on earth did they manage to, like a small Chinese man in 1920, defeat a huge Russian? Right. Or, you know, I don't know what level, but... Wrestler or boxer. Yeah. yeah, but a really tough guy who was out to humiliate Chinese people. Yeah. And consistently do it if we believe the stories. You know, what level of skill is that? Why don't we see that now? And why do the fighters all go to MMA? Or So, yeah, it was a great chance. He, he was a fighter. Um, yeah, that was a brilliant time of my life. But at some point, I just felt, uh, yeah, it was time to, to leave. So I left uh, probably after three years living with him. Not left him, but just left living there to right. get space as well. Yeah. Because he was the kind of teacher, every single thing you did, you know, who are you seeing? Yeah. What book? Which is great, but at some point, you need some space. Um, then when I left him, I met, um, well, the year before I, I, I left his house, I met a Xing Chuan master in Taiwan. He was very underground, low key, and just fantastic, Xing Chuan. Awesome. And he was fighting a lot against, uh, in the red light district, against bad guys. So one of the things him and his Kongfu brother did, they used to go uh, to the red light district, armed up with different traditional weapons and test their stuff. When they saw people bullying, the, you know, the, the people who went there, they would step in and um, test it. So his Xin Yichuan was very practical. Uh, an emphasis on Nagong and spear. That was the first time I'd used heavy spear. Uh, and then so that was a period a few months. When I come back to the West after that, people said, wow, your power has doubled from uh, a year ago. And it was because of this approach, like using different exercises to train the body, uh, plus testing, plus the spear, plus hitting, testing it on bags and things like yeah. that. So that was good. And then... Um, but then I met Her Jing Han in 1999 um, in, uh, in Taipei, Her Jing Han, the Bagua master. Mm -hmm. And again, it was just like a whole dimensional shift of understanding. And, um, you know, it, 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 as opposed to being a fighter, this man was like a Qing dynasty master come to life. Just the way he moved, uh, the way he saw life, the way he, he understood martial culture. Um, and the difference was with Marpa Chen, he was always, it was danger, just 24 hours a day danger. Um, and it was always his way. It was like imprint, and that was it. With Her Jing Han, it was dialogue. And the teaching, I found the teaching could go even deeper because he really cared. He really, really cared that the student understood. Um, and it was just so deep on day one. Yeah, but in the Nagong, they're very detailed, almost too detailed that it was overwhelming uh, detail. So that was the beginning of um, yeah, from '99 to now. That was uh, awesome training. He's a brilliant teacher. Yeah. So you continue to train in that same style? Yeah, yeah. Even testing. now, that's um, a lot of the concepts that he taught me is is how I put into my practice. Uh, not necessarily the forms, but it's just so universally uh, reasonable what he teaches, you know, 
and you can't, uh, just simple things that, that he said the Qing era fighters would have taken for granted. That when I look at other, most other teachers, <clears throat> they don't really have this kind of approach, like little things, tiny little things. Um, just for example, okay, circle walking. So a lot of the time teachers say, uh, find, a, find a level ground to circle right. walk. But his thing was actually find a place that's full up with, you know, roots growing out from the tree and like stones and stuff, because that is reality. Yeah. Also, that will make you move your hips, your choir, your legs, your center, uh, according to the change of environment and, and a surface. Yeah. It's a, it's a small thing, and everyone will say, yeah, we do that too. But it's emphasizing it and understanding why you do it. Um, or another thing, it, you see this all the time in modern Wushu, is we never, ever straighten the knee in practice because he like i remember once we were in a class and a student was doing a movement with the knee straight and he just took his leg oh but he didn't of course because yeah, he yeah. A gentleman, but he, he just said he said a hundred years ago somebody would have come and broken your leg for that he said never never and that kind of lesson goes on very deep. um little things like that you know how like you're being chased and you jump off a wall do you look back do you look forward Right. How do you, if you're standing with your back to a corner, what's the best way to escape from the corner? So a lot of this was coming from the uh, Gong Bao Tian, who was a, a Qing palace bodyguard. And these little things, maybe it saved somebody's life once. Right. So it become part of the, the, the teaching. That's fascinating. Mm. And did he go very deeply into the... Um underlining cosmological theory with you at all or was it more just based on physical stuff yeah, all the time the yeah. whole system in fact his system you can't practice without understanding you know the bagua the sershiang the liangyi the you know what other trigrams actually express like each trigram is related to a different body part in in his way of teaching uh, and i asked other teachers like really good bagua teachers since do you have this kind of knowledge? Um, I'll come to this in a second with another teacher, but for example, many of them would say, oh yeah, you can, you can explain it like that, but actually for fighting, you don't need to. Whereas Herjingham's thing is, well, how are you going to understand, like the, the lungs have a different way of expressing force to the kidneys, right? Completely different body part, origin of the force. So it's not that it's kind of... Uh, optional. Bagua itself means you've got eight body, eight forces expressed from like the back or the head or the or the heart. Do you see it's not yeah. it's not well you can add it on afterwards. No, it's not an add-on. It's it's the underlying um, what makes Bagua Bagua is this understanding of eight different forces in the body. Hmm. That's fascinating. And so could you maybe describe, obviously you'd already had quite a bit of experience when you came to him as a student, but did you see any students that came to him as beginners, how he would um, develop them? Was there like a systematic way that he developed them or did it depend on the individual entirely? Yeah, another interesting thing is he seemed, his teaching had a, a very clear <clears throat> like cosmology uh, progression as a system. So you got single change, a single change, by the way, is a whole level of training. It's not just your this movement. Yeah. It's a whole level of training, and it's the level of training to develop a fighter. Double change is the level of training to develop Nagong, eight uh, forces. And then there are six more, which are like things like um, snake palm level, which is for developing fingers for striking, and so on and so on. So as a system, you can read his book, for example. It's like the most systematic, uh, logical, reasonable explanation of Bagua with all the theory and the cosmology and da, 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 and all the, the basics that relate to them. But when it came to teaching, it seemed totally random. And, because, and I realized why. is because he, he's got such a huge system. And I remember one saying to him, oh, Shofu, you, what you've just taught is like really super... Most systems, like really secret, super amazing stuff. 
how do you just give it in a public seminar? He said, he said, when you have a huge sack full of tiny gold nuggets, he said, it's fine. Just give a few away. You still have so many, right? And that was, that is his system. Um, but his teaching, because I think there's so many methods for trying to develop. Okay, for example, uh, footwork. Some students do circle walking. They really struggle. It's tough, right? It's challenging. Yeah. All different mechanics. Um, how to use the ground, the gripping, the, the opposing forces, the twists, all in the same time. So what he would do was take one or two separate exercises and uh, just work that for two hours. So the, the training was five hours in the morning. Um, and then during that five hours, you might do, say, three different exercises. Um, so no, it was totally random. But I, I was there you know, on and off for many years, and he came here many, many times. So I've never seen him say, OK, everybody, this is stage one, some kind right. of practice. You do a form. Like, okay, we'll do a tray form. It takes like six months or Sosheng form. It will take two months. But around that would be hundreds of exercises. Um, so I came away with, you know, I, I noted everything down, by the way. Um, and I've just got huge notebooks full up with hundreds of exercises. And they're not made up by him. These are from what the people passed down. Gong, Gong Bao Tien and uh, Gong Bao Jai. It's an incredible system. Yeah. yeah. That's almost right. too much, almost too much, because if you talk, he, when I first went there, he had a few Taiwanese students um, who were fighters. You could see a couple of them could use it. Um, and he was younger then. He was, you know, 1999. So they were my, my brothers at the time. They kind of drifted off after a while. Um, and my teacher saw emphasized a bit more the like the internal aspect and um, but because I was interested in fighting so whenever we could we used to do even pre-fighting he would do it um, show application and drills lots of partner drills but I think now he tends to he said his mission is to help humanity evolve by cultivation of the Bagua principle not to train fighters he said that Yin Hu his, his mission was to protect the royal family Gong Bao, Gong Bao Tian his mission was to um, fight, was to train bodyguards and be a bodyguard. Gong Bao Jai, his mission was to bring it out of, uh, 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 sorry, Gong Bao Tian went to the village and taught outside of the palace. Gong Bao Jai's mission, his uh, nephew, was to bring it to Taiwan and teach He Jing Han. Then He Jing Han's mission is to help humanity evolve. Uh, yeah, so it's quite a big mission. Yeah, that, that's a great outlook, though. That's a great yeah. philosophy. So during this time period, um, were you still practicing the Xingyi that you'd learned previously along with your Bagua? As a minor, a minor yeah. system, yeah. So the whole uh, since since start, the whole uh, focus has been on circle walking and Bagua. And then a, a secondary is, is Xingyi training. Mm. Um, you know, Usually, or at least in my experience, you know, if you if you're training in Xingyi, your Xingyi teacher might recommend that you learn Bagua, or vice versa, you know, because they do complement each other. Did you find that to be the case with you? Did you did you get did Xingyi lend something to your Bagua? Uh, well, I think it's the opposite. Is that um, if you do Bagua, I thought about this a lot because. I've had students who have like, studied Xing Yi Chuan for a few years and then said, oh, I really want to learn Bagua. Now I think if you, if you practice Bagua properly, you don't need Xing Yi. Oh, really? If you, if you practice Xing Yi Chuan, at some point, Bagua can help you because of the circle. Mm, yeah. um, and even many Xing Yi Chuan masters, they took the circle in their advanced practice, yeah. right? So, and then there's another, a third way is... Uh, Xing Yi Chuan people learn often in middle age, they learn Tai Chi Chuan yeah. because of um, the neutralizing power. It really specializes in how to neutralize someone's force. Yeah. Mm. But Bagua people, normally they don't learn Xing Yi if they, like real Bagua people. Yeah. Um, it's just too big. And you've, got, you've already got straight line power. 
you know, piercing palm or, or, or pouch ray or whatever. Um, but shingy people, the, the circle adds definitely a deeper twist. That, yeah. Yeah, I think it does help for sure. I think they're complementary, but um, you also, at some point, when did you, you studied song style shingy also, right? Yeah. Yeah. So two, how did that two, come about? Uh, well, 2007, I had an injury. Um, kind of uh, martial art injury. I was, it was meant to be a, a interview with somebody. I was interviewing for my, for a book or something like that. And uh, somebody who had maybe jealousy problems uh, with who I studied with or was trying to prove something, very good practitioner, uh, struck me here, broke, clean. Um, so it was, and he had huge power. So, uh, and it was meant to be a demo of the photos. So yeah, I was almost, you can imagine that was a serious yeah. injury. So it took, it took years and years to recover. Wow. One of the outcomes of that is, uh, plus the, the, one of the vertebrae was damaged. So one of the outcomes of that was I couldn't walk the circle. <clears throat> I couldn't, I couldn't even walk for six months, let alone the circle. But when I could finally walk again, I couldn't, and it was, I was devastated because I yeah. loved the circle. Right. Yeah. Um, so luckily, Gordon So, who was my old Chingy student, funnily enough, from many years before, um, he had been visiting Song Family Village, a uh, Song Family courtyard. And he was saying, wow, this is so good, so internal, and Megong is really profound, and um, it's not like her base style, it's much more you know, soft and relaxed. Uh, so I think 2000, Nine, 2010, uh, because he was coming to England quite often. He started to teach me. And the great, the greatest thing about that that I got was the key word is comfortable. And, you know, again, it's like, well, yeah, we train in a comfortable way. But if someone says to you constantly, does it feel comfortable? Do you feel comfortable? Mm, not really. <laughs> okay, we'll practice in a way that's comfortable. Um, and honestly, Phil, it was a revelation. Because from not being able to walk for six months, then being able to walk a little bit, so I was just doing kind of, you know, baby stuff, um, to being able to practice again, it was brilliant. So I'll, I'll always thank Gordon for that. And the other interesting thing was, when I first met him, uh, he was studying Herbe Sal. He didn't have any power. You know, I could have let him hit me full power, probably. It would have hurt, but not, not hurt me, uh, not damaged me. So... I watched him in the space from like 2010 to now. I would not let this man hit me now. And it's all from very much me, like intent driven uh, practice. He ne he's, he's one of his things is don't train uh, looking for power or with power. So there's lots of visualizations similar to each one, like with elastics, um, just lots of make on Dantian, yin yang Dantian is, is quite uh, detailed. And that produces a soft, elastic, um, comfortable power. So you feel like you're very comfortable, but the other person, of course, feels the shock. Yeah. Um, so I saw him, I think last time was probably a few months, last year sometime. Uh, we still meet up. You know, he's a, of course, an old friend, lovely person. And then I took some students to study with him. But now these guys see, wow, he's got really good shot power. And he's not a fighter, but you just wouldn't want this person to, to touch you and hit you. So that was interesting because we don't, we normally, we come to a teacher fully formed, right? Yeah. When we, we come to our teachers, we're like, wow, I don't want this man to hit me. But when I knew him, he was just an ordinary guy. So, so I saw the process and the result is very clear. That's impressive to see. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know personally any song style practitioners, but just from what I've seen in videos, it, it does have a very unique, very smooth flow to the movement. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I've heard that in their system that all of the, for instance, all of the five element fists and maybe the animals also all have a, a yin and a yang variation or component. Is that true? Is that accurate? Yeah, but it's more that the body itself, like, you know, the yang channels of the body or the yang right, muscles. Yeah. 
Um, and it's because of the lower dantian. There's a, by the way, in, in song style, we don't turn the dantian. It's only this way. Like if you're looking from the side, it's this way. Right. So this is yin, basically drawing everything back to the center. This is yang. So meaning that the, the like pichuan, you'll have a yang p because it's this circle, because the dantian is, is producing that circle. If the dantian comes this way, it's a, it's a yin p. Like a, if you imagine a shoveling a snow, shoveling snow with a big shovel. If you dig the shovel in and lift up the shovel, it's yin. If you turn it over and dunk it, it's yang. Thanks. Any, any creature in nature, like a tiger, will draw in, it's yin. It will pounce, it's yang. So it's not really that it's yin yang variation for the sake of, you know, some system. It's right. just you will express it like that. Natural movement. Yeah. So could you maybe describe a little bit the negong, how it's different from what you would uh, experienced before in the song style Xing Yi Chuan? Yeah, it's pretty easy to understand in, in Hebei style, um, which I guess you practice. Herbe style, the emphasis on lower Dantian is expand, contract. Mm -hmm. So some people do it natural breathing, some with reverse breathing, right. but whichever, it's still um, expand, contract. In song style, it's there's two stages. One is expand, contract, then is yin yang. Oh, actually, then you combine it to a third stage. Ultimately, you've got uh, expand, contract with yin yang. Because expand, contract is like, you know, when you, you put the roots in the ground and you make power and it comes back up. Um, but then the, the yin yang gives it direction, very clear, either yang direction or yin. So it's almost like a, I don't know, supercharge. Uh, yeah. If you've seen that old Dai family swatting monkey, you know that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, some of the, we call them post exercises, but they're basically negong, are really similar to that, but maybe a more or less dramatic form um, doesn't look quite so dramatic as that, but it's essentially it is that. And but I feel now that Herbe style has to have yin yang, just like any system. But it's whether or not the teacher really emphasizes that. And I've heard that some old William Chen styles they do have yin yang. Um, in Taiwan, I learned it. It's not quite so detailed, but my teacher emphasized this because his grandfather had learned a. Xing Yi knew her and combined it with a Li Su Ni style Xing Yi. So we did, for example, you know, the long P trend that you see in the Muslim style of, of Xing Yi. And you have to use the Dantian like that. But I didn't, I understood the yang a little bit, but not the yin, because it's unless someone points out how do you use the Dantian like that, it's, it's, it's difficult. You can't learn it from a video. You know, it's, um, it's very detailed. You have to feel someone do it. And then, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it's still, it takes years and years to integrate your whole body with that movement. That's fascinating stuff. It's an interesting style. And by the way, Bill, I should mention, in terms of cultivation, because I know you're into cultivation, is um, the Xiao and the small uh, mm -hmm. cycle, technique cycle. Uh, in Song style, that's there very much uh, apparent, because when you do the Yang movement, it's encouraging that cycle. So there is a stage of practice. There are exercises where you consciously use that. And then the five gates to be this big circulation. Um, but not really in a kind of qigong help way. It's more once you get the, the frame very good, you can add that uh, or integrate it. Interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, there seems to be a very, uh, song style seems to have a very detailed theory behind it. Seems seems to be a mixture of sort of Buddhist and Taoist concepts as far as the, the theory behind. And the important uh, aspect of Yi Jing Jing, which, as I understand it, the Song brothers, uh, Song Shi Wang, Song Shi De, who developed the system, they in childhood they had a family system, a Shaolin system. Part of it was Yi Jing Jing, um, and then the the four classics. The, this book that the theory comes from. I don't know if you've read the four classics um, but of, of Song Tran and Xing Yi, but they are very detailed. Uh, some of the language is quite, especially one of the books, it's very obscure. 
but some of them are really clear, oh, okay, this is to develop this kind of power or, or Dantian or rib power. Um, so that's a book well worth to have a look at. In my uh, Nagong for Martial Power, I put a translation of, I think, three of the books with a lot of commentary. Yeah. I, I mean, it's explicit. Some of it is just, it is very clear, but you still need a teacher because if you make a mistake, the problem is you might think you're doing it right. Um, like training the ribs, for example. You know, the big mistake people make is they do it with too much force, too much power. And I always say, if you are if you have a scale of one to 10, use one, one as a, a standard, that's enough. And people say, mm, but there's no power. Actually, zero is no power, right? One right. is already, and why one? Because if you can do one, you still have sensitivity. Then it's easy, you can do two. If you start from eight, nine, and you really fall anything, he, you know, Nagong, whatever you're doing. So that's important, the comfortable. Then it's comfortable, yeah. Yeah, that's that's important, I think, in a lot of things for, for the longevity part of training, you know, being able to keep doing it rather than injuring yourself. Yeah. So let's talk about your own teaching. Um, what, what do you do now as far as teaching? Okay, so I came back to, to Britain um, quite some years ago and basically to look after my mum. She was getting a, a bit older and not so well. Um, and then uh, one more teacher I must mention is Paul Rogers. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure you've seen anything of Paul Rogers' work. But, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, after all my time in Asia and with many teachers, uh, I came back 2014, I think I contacted him, I'd seen his video. <clears throat> and then because I'd learned Wang Shu Jin's lineage of Bagua Xingyi, so I just said, oh, I'm doing a very, um, you know, I've learned a very similar uh, Bagua Xingyi. And he, the man was super friendly, super open, um, and so kind. That's uh, the other thing I have to say about my teachers, you know, all of them. I think if they weren't kind, I wouldn't have stayed because um, it's hard work, right? To, to really put yourself into a relationship. And the kindness of cultivated people is, I'd say, the most uh, significant factor. Uh, and then power, you know, but the, the character. Yeah. So Paul Rogers, um, the funny thing is, he has three or four students still. This guy is in the middle of uh, the West Country, has three or four students. His level, if he was to teach in China, he would be one of the top, top people, you know, and he doesn't look like it. He looks like a, like a musician, I think he is. But, um, so I went to see him, I visited him, uh, and just, again, it was another, you know, all the little things that were still, now, of course, the things were becoming more subtle. The questions were becoming much more subtle, but um, yeah, and also the, the, just, again, his character. And the fact he was in a little courtyard and just do what you want, we'll fight. Weapons, hands, let's do it. Literally like that, let's do it. Yeah. And just small guys like, well. <laughs> so after I flew around a little bit, I thought that this is my next stage was, um, especially for the pushing, he's really, really good at pushing and how to use that to bridge the gap, uh, fighting strategy, you know, just coming from an Yichuan core, but with Bagua Xinyi, very detailed. So the reason I mention that is um, at some point I knew, okay, I'm not going back to Asia very soon because, uh, you know, I had my duty here. Um, so I took that next phase very seriously and started to really work on what he taught me. Um, and also, it was a stage of, you know what, I've learned just so much. It's too much. And I started to crave simplicity and just returning to almost like I just want to throw it all away. It's too much. You know, I've been through the rehabilitation of injury with the song style and then learned lots of song style material. But even that was became, you know, it was just more and more things. And I thought, what is the core? What's the essence? of Xingyi or Bagua, what were these Dong Hai Chuan or, or Li Lo Neng really trying to say? I don't think they were teaching hundreds of forms. Um, 
so he was also part of that uh helping me to understand it was you know i'd go there for a few hours it would be one thing and it would grow to 10 but it would be one thing so i stopped doing forms i stopped doing most of my exercises i just kept doing circle walking and some of the simple exercises weapons um, and lots of testing i started to you know push fight with anyone i could meet uh, yeah and then my teaching also reflected that instead of just trying to transmit uh, this system with all of its forms what we do now is we focus uh, circle walking, single change, eight mother palms, and lots of detail in those things. Double change, you know, a few changes, but a lot of detail, especially strategic detail, body mechanic detail. Um, because I went through a period like 2003 to 2007. Every time I come back to Britain, I was teaching lots of forms, techniques, and it's good, but now I see that's not the that's not the way to really develop. Take one or two things, very simple things, go deep, deep, deep into it until you come out the other side and well, okay, that's what it is. And that's not easy even with one thing. So I, I believe that this is another reason Chinese martial arts is for fighting is degraded because we do too many things. And a lot of it was added on later. Bagua, for example, it was three changes. Eight mother palms, three changes. Each change was like a well of strategy. You know. Oh, can I mention one other person as well? Because oh, absolutely. Uh, if we have time, is uh yeah, of course. so then the, this whole thing happened with the, the COVID yeah. thing. I can't remember when was that 2020 or something like that. Um so there was a period of about I don't know, three, two, three years. And I contacted a master called uh, uh, Li Baohua, who's a Magwe Bagua master. I, I don't know if you've seen his, uh, his little promo video. I have he's not actually. particularly well, well known, but um, very well respected. So he's been to America, I think. Many yeah, he has a school here, I think. Yeah, he has little groups dotted right. around. So uh, initially I contacted him because I have a journal. So I, I produced a journal. I wanted to interview him for the first one. Um, so he's actually on the cover of the first gym. Uh, and again, super lovely, friendly, open person. And we started to dialogue, talk at least once a week for the next two or three years. Um, just like, okay, whenever you want, just call me. And we used to Skype and uh, um, just incredible. Again, another person like He Jinghan, who has so much depth of knowledge. He's been all over China to all the villages researching Magwe Bagua, every single person that, you know, even the the grand the grandsons, like uh, uh, maids, uh, granddaughters, nephews, something like any tenuous link yeah. he would find. And, and he found these scrolls and different things. So um, the conversations were just awesome. So often it would go two or three hours until uh, either it was time for him to sleep in Japan or, you know, I was hungry or something like that. And that went on for two or three years. And although I never met him uh, physically, I, I talk about him just to pay credit to the fact that something of his of this dialogue really went deep and also had an, uh, helped me understand the Bagua, especially some like cultural and technical aspects. Um, so he's another yeah, super interesting person. But my teaching, I don't represent him in any shape because uh, I'm not doing his system, but uh, what I do now is, is uh, basically a Chen style, circle walking, mother palms. Um, we do some of the Gong Bao Tian eight palms for the Negong to understand the eight forces of the body, and then uh, weapons, sword, spear, and lots of uh, detail. So that is my teaching and meditation. Yeah. And, and you you don't just teach, you also write, and you you bring your writing and your teaching, and you mentioned that you have a journal that you publish, which is both in physical and uh, e-book e format, mm -hmm. um, and that's all under line of intent, right? Is that the name of your company? Could you talk a little bit about that so people can find out about that? Yep, lineofintent.com. 
um, I started it. Uh, the very first books I, I wrote, I gave to a publisher. And uh, then I discovered, okay, uh, better to self-publish. So I was in Taiwan probably in 99, and I found a little printer. I published, tw printed 20, uh, 200 copies of my first book. Uh, internet was just new then, so I started to distribute my internet, and it just grew. Uh, and then I started to take other people's manuscripts and publish them. Uh, and now I gave a lot of them to a different publisher eventually because it was so much. It's a lot of work. But now I also publish the books of James Cast, who's a uh, kind of yeah. Yichuan Chini mm -hmm. guy, and um, Mo Ming, who's a Hong Kong-based uh, Magui Bagua teacher and Tai Chi teacher. Um, and my books, my journals. So, yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, well, people can find out all about that at lineofintent.com, like you said. And, of course, you've got a great YouTube channel also. Um, one last question I wanted to ask, and I ask everybody this. What do you think is the future of these arts? Things uh, like Bagua, Shingi, Tai Chi. It's up to us. Let's see. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. I, I also just like with my small group of students, I also wonder about this for each of them. You know, how will your life be? Um, I teach, uh, yeah, I probably have eight or nine students. I Luckily, I don't have to do this as my main source of income. So I'm just very, uh, I teach people that I feel a really good connection. Um, and I, I'm always thinking, how will your life be? I've no idea about the bigger picture, but I always think if you, like I encourage them, just 10 minutes a day, you know, if they're like, a lot of them are university students here, so 10 minutes a day, and of course, if you do 10 minutes, you'll, you'll appreciate, oh, they'll do 20 minutes. Don't give up. Then their life can be shaped by the practice, not something you add on to your life. But understand, this is a, something to put into your core like a seed and your life will start to flourish you'll get internal power wisdom you know the confidence you can defend yourself of course um so for my students i i hope they can all have very positive lives uh for the future of the art i, I have no idea let's see because um we have to keep extremely good quality and i think that means doing less doing less, doing less forms, less techniques, but more, more depth. And encouraging good people, that's the other thing why I write, is to encourage, bring out these masters like Tanaka, another amazing um, uh, Daitoru master, uh, traditional jujitsu, Hakuru, uh, who's in, in another little town in Britain with just a handful of students, incredible kid, but nobody knows him. So I started to, you know, make little films about him and Paul Rogers and just with the hope that people will meet them, go and meet them. Because if you don't know someone exists, you, you right. may meet them by chance if you're, if you're lucky. But um, right. so let's hope we can keep these arts alive at least one more generation. And I teach uh, one 11-year-old uh, girl as well, who's my niece. She's been training since she was like five and also her and my, my other wonderful students, I feel, I see this thing grow inside of them. They don't know because they think it's just, uh, often right. it's just, just something they're doing. But it's very profound, as you know, because you've been doing it for 40 years. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that it, it really brings so much to you that if you can pass it on to just one person, they're almost certain to pass it on to someone else just because they want to share that with them. Yeah. yeah. Well, Alex, it was truly a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate you taking time out to talk to me today. Thank you.